Hey, welcome to the Driven Stone Podcast, the podcast with two friends with a glass. Have a conversation. I'm Nick. I'm Kyle. Kyle. Yes, sir. We find ourselves here again. Where's that? Where well, am I right now? <laughs> the the honest answer is everywhere and nowhere because we're we're recording this via the interwebs. So uh Ah, sweet. One of those uh work from home situations. <laughs> right. Sometimes we can't get the schedule to work out. Honestly, we could get the schedule to work out, but here's what happened. <laughs> we we recorded some interviews for upcoming episodes, right. and then we tried to fit in our normal recording at the same time, and then time just, you know, uh was fleeting. Yeah. So it here's happens. where we are. <laughs> exactly. We're making it work. We are. Simultaneously live from the library and the whiskey lounge. And the whiskey lounge. Yeah, both recording places. We actually record in three different places. Most people know this. We record in the library. We yep. record in now what we're calling the Whiskey Lounge, and sometimes on the Back Porch Studio. Back Porch Studio. And occasionally. Or live know, on location. Uh, or live on location, exactly. We've actually recorded a Maybe lot. from a boat sometime soon. <laughs> You're not wrong. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm so looking forward to that. Uh, those, those are going to be fun episodes. Like, we can get, like, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 episodes out of that. <laughs> Five a night. <laughs> Carol's like, y'all, y'all going to be recording? I'm like, uh-huh. <laughs> Take, take yes, a, ma'am. I'll take the recording devices. Anyway, Over so a big plate of chicken tendies. Chicken tendies, and, and maybe we can find us some uh, of those unicorn whiskeys. Yeah. All right, Kyle, this week, uh, because we're recording in two different locations, you yep. and I actually have a a bottle between the two of us. It's the same bottle, and that is the Sazerac Rye Straight Rye Whiskey. Heck yeah, from old uh, Buffalo Trace. Yeah, this is a Buffalo Trace product. Here in our state, Florida, this is actually a fairly Difficult bottle to find. I'll be honest with you, I haven't seen many of them here in in Florida anyway. Yeah, same. I don't know if I've honestly ever seen it in Florida. Yeah, but I got mine in Washington State. You got yours, what, Alabama? Oh, yeah. (laughs) I swear. I got about 50% of my stuff. So I I brought this all the way across country because... I went When I went to Washington last year, I saw it, and it was like, I don't know, 30 bucks. I'm like, I'm going to take that because I've never seen it in Florida. And I know that right. it's one of those, because it's a Buffalo Trace product, it's one of those like, you know, you kind of got to have it and try it. So we both bought it. We both have it. Yeah, totally. You got you got some specs? I got, I got to look up specs. You want to read a bit of the bottle while I'm doing that? Yeah, here we go. Bottle words. Sazerac rye. Straight rye whiskey. 45% by volume. 90 proof. Beautiful. This rye whiskey <laughs> is the perfect choice to make the Sazerac cocktail, America's first cocktail. Not a lot of cool bottle words. No, not really at all. It's a it is a cool bottle though. Yeah, it's interesting shaped. It's almost like they took the Blanton's bottle and then like stretched it. Yeah, kind of the the weird uh like the angular, geometric angular ridges kind of thing. You took a Blanton's bottle and squished it and then stretched it out. You'd have the Sazerac. But it also has... I don't know if it's... I was going to say, I don't know if it's fair to call it. I was thinking about it. I don't know if it's fair to call it a Buffalo Trace product. <sighs> or is it is it just a, a Sazerac product that they make at Buffalo Trace? It's technically a Sazerac product. Because Sazerac is the parent company of Buffalo Trace. It's owned by the right. Sazerac company. But... There's a, a bar in New Orleans called the Sazerac House that yep. like it is just chock full of this. And if you look on the front of the bottle, the kind of the filigree and the way this uh, the font is, it reminds me of it reminds me of New Orleans. Yeah, a kind totally. of like French Revival kind of style a little bit. Yep, it's got that kind of um, florally exactly. kind of a uh, design notes on it. Yeah. So being that it is a, a Sazerac product, and I know that, like we said, it's technically not Buffalo Trace, although it is something that I believe they do distill at the Buffalo Trace distillery, much like a lot of Buffalo Trace products. It doesn't say Buffalo Trace, but it is Buffalo Trace. Right. But the mash bill is rumored to be at least 51% rye, which tells me nothing <laughs> because that means it's a rye. Congratulations, Buffalo Trace. Thank you. <laughs> well, I mean, and it has straight rye whiskey on the bottle, so that would be the assumption anyway. Well, to be yeah, a straight rye it has whiskey to be at least has 50. to be at least fifty-one. Correct. Correct. If you're rye. gonna if you're gonna call it a rye, it has to be at least fifty-one percent. A couple of different places I, I looked around, I, I found kind of the the average was fifty-one percent rye, thirty-nine corn, ten percent malted barley. So sounds like whiskey. It sounds like a rye whiskey, and I also found interesting that they they put no age statement on the bottle, but a lot of different websites I found say that the age ranges between four and six years. Which is pretty good, right? And and that's, that's something that Buffalo Trace for their lower products or the Sazerac Company all the way for their lower uh, products, they don't put a whole lot of age statement. And I wonder why, because you know a lot of companies like really tout an age statement, and they're not big on age statements. 
Right. I mean, I got a yeah. bottle of Trace here and no age statement. Yeah, same. I find it interesting because so many bourbons, you know, they put that on there. You know, Blanton's doesn't put an age statement on it. I think it has the fill date and possibly the dump date. Right. But, yeah, no, it's it's not a, a, a common thing by any means. I wonder if, like, for them, it's one of those we're sampling the product and we pull it when it's ready. And so if we put four years on the bottle, then that beholds us to four years. But you could just put, like, a, a little label on the side, like, this bottle aged four years. I don't know. Like, they don't really put m- many, like, if you think about, like, just kind of, like, your entry-level points of any bottle, very few of them come with an age statement on them anyway. Yeah. I feel like most don't really put it on there. They're more about, like, single barrel, small batch. Sure. Uh, if it's a bonded, stuff like that. Right. Yeah, age statements, point. you know, I think until they really kind of jump up there into the 9, 10-year level, do they really ever start putting those on there. But it's one of those things of, like, I mean, a lot of people care about that. So for sure. I mean, I, I'll, I'll take as much information as you'll give me. Yeah. Well, in the case of uh, any sort of Buffalo Trace product, you ain't getting none. Ain't, ain't much. <laughs> no. You, yeah, you we'll get, give you a name. <laughs> we'll give you the name. We'll give you the government warning and uh, good luck. <laughs> give you the name of the juice and you can shut up. <laughs> exactly. You will like this regardless of what we say. Yeah, it's because Buffalo it's Buffalo Trace. Trace. You're going <laughs> to want it. Exactly. Shall we get into it? Yeah. All right. Let's go. Sounds similar. Honestly, like hold hold your bottle up to the uh, your camera there. We both have about the same amount out of our bottle, which is a pour. Yeah, <laughs> right, right down to the shoulder. <laughs> Literally, basically, we've had a neck pour. That's exactly all sip. we've had. Yeah, there we go. All right, I'm gonna pour. Okay, you go ahead. There we go. And now you. Man, ain't nothing like a virtual pour. That was good. Ooh. Smells like rye in this room right now. Yep, whiskey is in the air. Man, I'm leaning heavy into the big pours. I don't know if you can see my glass, but uh, I got it's been a it's been a thing for you. <laughs> I don't know. You, were, you were trending big big pour. That was my new name in college. So when I'm looking at the color here, whiskey. It is whiskey. I'm gonna go lighter than normal. You think so? It's edging light to me. You know, so weird. Like if I'm looking at it, I'm I'm tilting the glass sideways and I'm looking straight through it. It's like a a, a dark straw water. Like, and what I mean by that, in, in terms of like your, you said a little bit lighter, that's what I feel like. It's slightly less than golden honey. I mean, I, I feel like I could almost be convinced that this was a scotch. On the nose. Definitely a rye. Yep. But it's not like screaming rye. No, there's, there's some really sweet aspects to it, like some really sweet notes there. Yeah, I feel like it's leaning raisiny. Yeah, stone fruit of some sort, like, like maybe like peach. Like I get a little bit of peach, which is weird because... On a rye, normally it's all piney, cinnamony, kind of that like black tea notes. Right. And this is just. It's I like, mean, I get all those things. Sure. No, they're there. But they're they're subdued. It's like sweet fruit and then rye, like all the things yeah. that you expect out of a rye. It is 90 proof. So I'm getting a slight bit of proof. All right. You ready to get into it? Let's take a sip. Apple juice. <laughs> That's just like, hmm. I get apple juice. I get I get rye honey. Like honey on rye bread. Graham cracker and apple juice. I get after school special. That's what I get, Kyle. <laughs> oh, I got a little bit of a bourbon hug. Rye hug going on. Woo. That just hit me. Um, The first thing I'm thinking of is like it's balanced. It's really sweet forward. Absolutely. But then it comes through with a spicy rye that I think matches it pretty dang well. Yeah. That rye note. I really actually like. I mean, you get the piney nature. You get a little bit of that numb tongue going on. You get a little bit of the cinnamon, but not like the big red fake cinnamon, like a nice right. like cinnamon stick kind of cinnamon. Right. But that sweet, I think you're right. To me, it's on the high end of the sweet. And I, I'm i going to say that's a negative for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's balanced in the way that like the sweet does match the rye. I wish that sweet were not as high as it is. I don't mind how sweet it is. I wish I'm what I'm missing is in some of the great rise that we've had. And I'm thinking of that Balconis. Oh, Bal- yeah. To me, the sweetness in this is so much brighter. Whereas, oh, like, yeah. In like that Balconis, it's such a darker sweet. You know, it's more of a syrupy sweet where this to me is kind of it's just a brighter, almost younger sweet no i I agree maybe maybe even perhaps like a bit more candy sweet Mm. i don't know i can't get past honey like it's very much honey it's very honey very honey you're right it's like rye honey i think you nailed it like now that i'm really thinking about it 
It's you took some like orange blossom honey, you toasted a piece of like marble rye bread and just spread it across that. Maybe a little bit of butter because there is some of the like the quintessential vanilla butter toffee notes that I get out of almost every trace product that right. is there. So it's almost like you, you took butter, a little bit of butter, some honey, spread it on marble rye bread, and here you go. Yeah, like you absolutely saturated that rye bread with that honey. <laughs> right. Like dripping off the sides. It's basically baklava at this point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. So to me, and literally just having like essentially the neck pour out of this, I don't like how thin this is. Hmm. That is a problem with some of the rides that I've had here lately that are, you know, less than that 100 mark. And I don't know if it's just proof, but they just, they're thin. And to me, that's what this is. It's not, there's not a whole lot of mouthfeel. I'm not going to say it's watery because it's, it's, it's headed in that direction, but it's just like, there's no body to it. I don't disagree. I, and I, I wouldn't be afraid to say it does taste a little watered down. But yeah, no, I totally agree. Like it, it doesn't have the thicker mouthfeel that you kind of want. But at the same time, like just some of the great rides that we've had, where it has had that that mouthfeel a little bit more present, I do miss that. Yeah. But at the same time, like I can I kind of really appreciate how almost simple this is in terms of like this would be a fantastic introduction into rye. Absolutely. Like no joke. It's pretty solid to me. Perfect entry point rye. You, you've got like. You've got your wild turkey rye. You've got your wild turkey one on one rye. You've got your EC rye. Like great entry point ryes. Yep. This I think fits solidly among them. Yeah, for sure. It's got a. It's got name recognition. It's the Saz rye. It's got you know all those rye notes, but it's not super harsh. You've got. It's not high proof. You've got these really nice sweet notes. Perfect. Yeah, it's not too complex, and I, I think that's. I, I bet that fifty one percent rye is pretty accurate. It's not a huge rye punch, right? And, and it's not, and it's not the one hundred percent rye that you know you get from like the piggyback or something like that. Yeah, exactly. That might be a little, little off putting for somebody, but somebody that's like just getting into rye and wants to try rye, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't throw you at Pikesville right off the bat. No, but this would be a great place to start. Well, and and I will say this is a great daily sipper rye too. You know, it's, sure. it's priced in that $30 range when you find it at MSRP. Um, I don't know what you got your bottle for, bottle for, but mine was about that because the, the Washington state tax is a little funky. Um, sorry, Washington, but your liquor tax is all weird. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's about that $30 MSRP, and I think that's perfectly priced. You know, I've yeah. seen it in, in some liquor stores um, outside of the state here where this is like a $60 bottle, and... I mean, obviously, that's a whole argument that we've had multiple times at this point, but it's not a $60 rye. It's, to me, very clearly a $25 to maybe $35 rye. It's a daily sipper. It's kind of strange to me that it's on the bottle, that your first sentence on the bottle is, this is the perfect choice to make a cocktail with. Right. As if to say, you know, and, and you know, I think we said the same thing about the piggyback. How yeah. it says it on the bottle that, you know, this is kind of more or less to be mixed this is not necessarily meant to be a sipper you know to have neat i think it's such a strange choice to put that right on the bottle i mean i can certainly you know appreciate the fact that you want this to be uh so closely associated with the popular cocktail right but at the same time like you know let the thing breathe on its own but maybe that is like if that's the purpose that you see for it then maybe that's just kind of like how we should take it. That's such a really good point, though, of like Jack Daniels doesn't necessarily market itself as this is a perfect for a Jack and Coke. Like, right. we know that most people that are drinking Jack Daniels are probably drinking it in a Jack and Coke or something similar. Right. Maybe that's too too much of a generalization. But, you know, they're not doing that. Now, you go to a liquor store and you're going to find next to Jack Daniels bottles of Coke. Sure. Right. But, like, the fact that they are marketing this on their bottle as – this is a cocktail drink or this is a cocktail making bottle like right. this liquid make it into a cocktail is interesting and i'm not going to say it's a negative but it's like why would you market it that way well i i thought the same thing about the piggyback of like it's a little off-putting in a way of like because this is how i like to drink my whiskey and your bottle is almost suggesting to me that i shouldn't Right. Or that that's not the appropriate way to enjoy this one. Right. You want to mix this one. Well, and I think like for piggyback specifically, you know, back to that, it's like that, you know, 
I have made this thing, this bottle to fit perfectly in the hand. And it really does. Like, I really like the way this piggyback bottle feels. Uh, I got an empty bottle here, just killed one. Um, but yeah, it's, it's like, we've made this to make drinks with. Like, this is why this right. exists. Right. So it's, you know, it almost, you know, in the back of my head, I'm sitting here thinking of like, I don't know, may, maybe I like this too much because it's not the intention of it. Right. Right. Or maybe in my, in my head, I'm not giving it, you know, the credit that maybe it, it deserves because of that. Well, to me, it's exactly what I think it is. It's a $30 rye. It's not super heavy on the rye. It's not a 100% rye. It's got the sweet notes that you're going to like out of this. It's nothing super special. Am I going to have to have a bottle of this on my shelf? I'm not. Nah. I, I'm, I'm good with this as my only bottle. Now, right. if someone's like, hey, I've got Saz rye, sure, I'll have it. And that's fine. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't dislike it. Um, but there's nothing that jumps out at me that like, man, this is good. Whereas other rye, thinking back to something like a rare breed rye or or that Balconis rye, I want that. Sure. Yeah. When you're when you're wanting a rye to sip on, you've got those in your head, and then you know if you're you, you need a quick bottle of rye right quick, and you run to the store, you see they've got Sazerac. That's good. That'll work. Yep. But do I understand the draw and people like really really wanting this? I don't. I really don't. But I mean, you know, at the same time, like there's so many bottles like that like <laughs> right. why does anybody want blanton's like why do they want careful that 93 careful buddy proof? You're, you're you're treading in some really deep water sharks but in to, them I'm waters just say i'm just saying to the craze that it is right of hunting that thing down and willing to pay hundreds of dollars for a 93 proof bourbon right. okay you know, you need to you need to try it. You need to you know have that experience, and it's good good for you. Friends of ours posted on Twitter that they got a bottle of Blanton's in Japan, and they said you know what it was in yen, and basically it came out to be like two hundred fifty bucks. And they're like, oh, man, God. I'm so happy to get it. And I'm like, cool. And I thought it was like the Blanton's, like the black label or green label or, right. or you know whatever. It's just nope, regular regular Blanton's. I'm like, mm. what? And you brought that back from Japan. I'm like, good for you. You found it. Awesome. Cool. But like. 250 bucks nah yep. that's that's a 60 dollar bourbon at best <laughs> yeah all right Cal. now that we've got a drink what do you want to talk about this week let's talk about a movie that just came to hbo max a couple of well at this point probably a couple of weeks ago Ooh. but you hadn't had the chance to see it now you've had the chance to see it i have we obviously owe it to talk about the batman the batman yeah, I like it. A lot of great things because you know you know who does the soundtrack for the Batman. Friend of the podcast, Michael Giacchino. Michael Giacchino. Yeah. And I got to say, that that Batman theme is possibly the best thing about that movie. Okay. I've got thoughts. Do you want to just jump in here? We know Michael Giacchino, friend of the store. Friend of the store? Store? We got a store now, Kyle? Friend of our store. Michael Giacchino, friend of the podcast, makes great scores. I've liked everything he's done. Here's my thing with this particular score. I like it. It's a bit repetitive to me. You get that same, that that Batman score, which is kind of feels like a riff, a version of the Darth Vader, or like the Jaws almost kind of score a little bit. Just it's it's constantly throughout. That reprise every time you see him in the Batman suit, which is mm-hmm. a lot of this movie, which I really enjoyed in that case, it's a lot of that like duh, like that kind of like just deep, you know, brooding aspect. Right. And I actually began to notice that. And why I'm bringing it up, I like the score, but when the score, I start to almost like notice the score, it begins to take me out of what I'm seeing on the screen. Because to me, like the score should enhance what's on the screen. But because I'm, you're hearing that score so co- consistently throughout, it's like, wait, wait, oh, there it is again kind of thing. Right. I don't know if that's your experience, but I just, for whatever reason, that stuck out with me in the first viewing of this. Fair enough. I mean, I didn't, I don't know that I would, I can't really speak to the score as a whole, but like just that Batman theme oh, that he's yeah. got, the theme is a take on, it's, I forget, the, it's the Death March by somebody. Right. Which is the da da da. I mean, it is like almost like Vader, Vader-esque. Uh, or Imperial March. Right. Like I saw, I saw, I don't know if it was Giacchino talking about it or, or somebody else talking about it, but you know, it's a, it's a famous death March sure. more or less. I really enjoyed it. Like any, like, especially that first moment where you're introduced to the Batman 
in the in the subway station with all the the clown faced goons, right. and he just starts laying into them. And Batman slowly emerges out of the shadow, like you hear his footsteps first, and then he comes through, and that yeah. that, that theme is playing. Like it really worked for me. This movie does a great job of those moments. Like there are incredible moments in this movie, right? That really they nail that idea of Batman as we've come to know him as like this dark creature of the shadows. One hundred percent so. Um in, in in almost every iteration, every time you see him, and, and I hate to want to make comparisons to the Nolan Batman because I don't think that's wholly fair because you got three films versus this one. But it is the Nolan Batman is kind of like the high watermark for Batman. And yeah, so absolutely. it's easy to compare this to that in that in the Nolan Batman, you do have scenes that are in the day. You have scenes that are, you know, your Bruce Wayne scenes. A lot of those scenes are brightly lit. There's not this sense of like dark brooding, but in this movie, everything is dark. Yeah. Like pretty I, much a hundred percent of the movie. Right. Like I don't, is there a day scene in this entire movie? Like maybe one or two, maybe well, like, you know, they, they even, even the, when they're, when they are, it's like stormy and cloudy, like, it's never like a bright right. blue sky day in Gotham. Like right. It's always it's always dark and rainy or it's nighttime. Correct. Like I think that's actually the location of Gotham is it's like, you know, in the Arctic Circle <laughs> where it's like no, we, we get, you know, six months of night. Every, everyone thinks it's actually like New York, but it's really like Helsinki. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. So in, in terms of that, like I, I agree with you that this score absolutely mirrors what you want that to be. And and I looked it up real quick. It's actually Chopin is the uh, the funeral there march. There you go. Yeah. It, it's so cool that in that it mirrors that throughout. And you have that dark, you have that brooding, and it very clearly epitomizes that character. And right. that I really like. And yeah. and the other sound design too in terms of the the score sound design, I think it's pretty good. You have like the um the Nirvana song. I think you hear that twice. It's really like soft, but like definitely like super dark. I love the dark aspect of this way more than I thought I would because what I read or what I heard before seeing it was like, oh, it's just too dark. It's just too dark. It's washed out. It's too dark. But I, I love that the sound design mirrors what you want Gotham to be. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it's definitely dark. Every aspect of this movie is dark. Everything. Yep. <laughs> Lighting, cinematography, th this being like the first time we're seeing the character of the Riddler since Jim Carrey's take of the Riddler. Right. Uh, he's really dark. Like yeah. everything is dark. What was what was something else you enjoyed about it? Because I'll be honest, I had a lot of things that I wasn't crazy about. Okay. I probably got more of those things than I do. Well, uh, absolutely bright, positive notes about it. I, I think like when I think about films like this, especially movies that there is such a, a long history of a character yep. like Batman, characters like that. And this is what separates those kind of characters and the difficulty in pulling off those characters to me versus something like the the first phase, the first couple of phases of the MCU and that a lot of those characters people knew, but they weren't like super familiar with outside of, you know, your your big comic book nerds. Whereas like people know Spider-Man, people know Batman, people know Superman. So right. the what I really appreciated out of this is that you're not playing kooky Batman. You're not playing, you know, like super billionaire uh, vigilante Batman. You're playing detective Batman. Right. And you're playing like, I mean, multiple times, kind of the, not a joke in the film, but it has become a thing is like, I am vengeance, that kind of thing. Right. And he becomes that. And he actually is that. Because Bruce Wayne as a character is not that Bruce Wayne that we get to me in Nolan. He's not the, the kind of Tony Stark, Iron Man, billionaire, not the, Bruce Wayne and Iron Man are the same character, but he's not that kind of character. He's more this aloof, um, very insular, very uh, wants to be secluded kind of person. And I think that they nail so perfectly in this version because he has zero friends. I mean, like Alfred is really the only person who is, is Alfred's played by um, 
Oh god, Andy, Andy Circus. Yeah, yeah, so good. Like I loved his Alfred. Like I love that take. As much as I love Michael Caine as Alfred, I loved Andy Circus as Alfred. I think it was perfect. But his only friend is is Alfred. Everybody else, he like there's no connection there. And and it's only really until like Alfred almost dies that he realizes how much Alfred actually means to him. Right. So like that I think perfect. Like I love that aspect, and you nailed it. Yeah, I appreciate how like they 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 make mention of it in the movie about how like Alfred's pushing him like, you know, you also have responsibilities as Bruce Wayne. Like you've also got to keep up that side of who you are in terms of really making this whole Batman thing work. Right. And he's trying to push him to go do more things and be more public as Bruce Wayne so that he can be more effective as Batman. Right. And but, you don't get that in this movie, but you can see him pushing it. Oh, so yeah. So it'll probably be a thing in the sequels. Well, I, I think you don't get it directly, but you definitely get that like that sense 100% so. And that's what I really appreciate about this iteration of Batman is that that pushback of like, no, I don't want to be, you know, the Wayne. I want to be the Batman. Right. You know, I don't want to be the figurehead of this this corporation, the figurehead of this this family and, and, and philanthropy and that. I want to be this thing. Yeah, I think that actually worked really well in the Nolan series of him absolutely coming out as this, this jerk Bruce Wayne that is like nobody wants to be around that guy. He's such a douche. Right. So that it's like it makes people look away from Bruce Wayne as there possibly being a connection. There's no way that guy could be Batman. Right. Whereas he's, he's like too much of a self-centered asshole to at be Batman. This, yeah. At this point in this series, this iteration of Bruce Wayne, you could totally see him being Batman. Yeah. Because he is so reclusive and brooding and like, you know, uh, you, you kind of get it. You yeah. kind of, you kind of could start to make connections. And I, you know, that, that was a little bit of a, uh, for me, watching it, I was kind of like, "No, I, I need, I, I want the the Playboy too, right? Because it balances it." I disagree in that I don't need the Playboy because I've seen the Playboy. You know what I mean? Like I've seen that, and, and this is where, like, what I mean by like a, a version of a Batman movie has to understand that we as Batman viewers are getting, we know all of the Batman. And that's such a hard part about making a film with a, such a beloved character is that you're now creating a new Batman for you know your 12, 13, 14 year olds, give or take, but you're also playing with Batman for your you know mid 30s people who really love Batman. So for me, and there's I, also going to be a lot of people that this is how they're introduced to Batman. That's, that's exactly what I'm saying. At like, the same time, this is your Batman, right? So for me, like. I appreciate that I don't have what you just mentioned. I don't need the 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 jerk Bruce Wayne because I understand now like we don't get any origin story. This is not an origin story. This is a, you know, in media rest like all these things have already happened. So I understand that he is this guy. And and I actually I appreciated that. Like I didn't need all that setup. I mean, and, I didn't need the setup, but I feel like I don't know. I, I feel like Bruce Wayne is a character also. Like even Absolutely. going back to Adam West, that Bruce Wayne was kind of a I don't think he was like that self centered playboy. Sure. But he was very like kind of lavish and you know, you live in a mansion kind of a thing. Right. You you couldn't possibly be the Batman. Right. Kind of, and right. then you go up into like the Michael Keaton era of like Bruce Wayne being more charismatic right and being the guy that all the ladies want to be with and i guess that's that's probably a better way of explaining adam west too but this version of bruce wayne where it's just like he's not a he's not a character even the people in the city don't know him they recognize him right but like there is no there's no identity to bruce wayne so I think it'll be fun to see that come out and how they deal with that sure. in in future movies well and i i think because you- that'll be like so strange to see this version of him doing that kind of thing well and i think that that's what it's going to be interesting in terms of alfred pushing him so you get the almost the reversal where in every other iteration you've gotten bruce wayne and batman now you've really just got batman and then he's going to become bruce wayne too in terms of that aspect and i don't know if that's the case but if alfred pushes him to be also bruce wayne this philanthropic you know, kind of person that like you've got to take the heat off of Batman, so you've got to, 
you know, nobody wants to suspect you as a Batman, I think maybe they're going to play with that further in the future too. Right. What else I liked about this before we get into things that we didn't like, I really liked Pattinson as Batman. And I didn't think, I'm, I'm thinking just like overall. Yeah. I didn't go into this expecting to. Like, I like Pattinson as an actor. I think the choices that he's made after or post Twilight, I think have been really good choices. The dude's actually a pretty good actor. Um, yeah. And I, I love him as Batman. I love that they decided to really showcase the grittiness. I love that, like, I mean, he's a good looking dude anyway, but they, right. like, weren't afraid to. I guess, like, a question I've always had of, like, so. Once you change out of that bat suit, you've got like, you've got eyeliner, and like they've right. never addressed that before. And yeah. like in this one, they address it in like every single scene, just yeah. to like push that forward. Yeah, so they're totally. not afraid to do those kind of things. But I think he plays this character much better than I, I think like people thought he would. And and maybe that's off the heels of Batflick. Right. You know, so you, you kind of think of that like, oh, it's just, you know, Ben Affleck being Batman. I'm like, oh, do I need this? I don't. But I think that that enables Pattinson's Batman to shine even further. I mean, I think it's, you know, it's definitely a hard thing, I'm sure, to be able to pull out a performance being Batman. Yeah. Because, like, I mean, you, you think back through all the people who are Batman, and it's like, all you really have to do is be an actor because the majority of Batman is the suit. Correct. So, you know, you're just getting a jawline and it's almost like, what do you do to make your Batman while you're in the suit unique? Right. Even in this instance, I feel like it's almost his costume that makes his version of Batman unique in that way. I don't know if this works because it's Pattinson or this works because it's just Pattinson, Pattinson following a, a Batman like script kind of thing of like, right. you know, you just do this and like you are Batman, but there's something about it that maybe it's, it's the combination of everything. Cinematography score, um, you know, detective type thriller story versus, you know, like straight up superhero kind of story. Right. Um, maybe it's the fact that I, this isn't an origin story. I don't have to rehash all of that, but there's something about him as Batman that just like, it, it gives me something more. And maybe it's because now that I'm like, as I'm kind of processing and, and thinking about this and talking with you about it, I wonder if it's because the choices that he's made as an actor have also kind of put him in this position of you kind of are that kind of guy. Like, sure, you do interviews. You're definitely a celebrity, but you're not flashy, go out, like super popular media kind of celebrity. At least right. you're not. You're now. not. You're not. Chris Hemsworth, you're not Chris Pratt. Right. You're not that kind of celebrity. You right. were, but you clearly like have eschewed all of that and now you're like, Well, no, I don't no. think he ever was. I don't think he was ever like a out in the spotlight, you know, kind of a person. I think he was always very kind of reclusive. guarded. Well, I yeah. think I, what I mean by that is I think like um like maybe popular media back when he was doing Twilight, like really pushed him as like this this hunk of a, a young guy. Um, sure. And I, I think you're right. Like, he never really was, at least in my estimation, that, like, wanting like, to exploit that. I don't know that he that. has social media. Right. You know, if he does, I've never seen it. Whereas, like, a lot of those, like Chris Pratt, Chris Hemsworth, like, a lot of those guys have it and they're on it all the time. And, mm. you know, or like The Rock. Like, sure. It's just everywhere doing everything. So, like, and that's maybe that's it, too, of, like, you're not conflating the characters together so that you right. can almost, like, no, 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 he is Batman. Yeah. You you don't think about everything Ben Affleck has done prior to Batman. You're like, oh, he's gonna do Batman. Right. You're you're thinking of like, no, no, he he actually is that character. Yeah. I remember when they announced him as it, like at that point in time, he wasn't far enough removed from Twilight for me to really get excited about the casting. But after seeing Tenet, yeah, I was like, I was fully like, okay, no, no, he'll kill it. Well, like that'll be great. I read a story that he was in the middle of filming Tenant, and he went and and did the um the screen audition. test or audition or something yeah for this and like he had to take some time or like a day away from Tenant, and no one was like you're doing the batman stuff weren't you and he's like yep <laughs> like no one yep. knew right away well i think i think nolan actually ended up finding out before he did that right he got that the he role. was that he was batman sure but it's also like I mean, I don't know if you saw Good Time or or any uh, you know any of his other smaller kind of roles. Yeah, but the dude's just a good actor. 
he yeah, for sure he plays that like really that specific kind of person well you want to talk about problems or you got anything else uh positive the amazing positive that is the car scene the car oh, chase man like that and that's an and that's another point of uh at the end of the scene when the theme is like maxed out and you know the penguin's car has been flipped upside down and Batman's walking up to it like that shot oh, with the so music good. blaring after like that intense of a car chase nailed it. Like yeah. that's that's beautiful. Absolutely. Absolutely love that whole scene. Like that like from the moment he turns on the car, you got the Batmobile with the jet blasting out the end and this is, you know, it's like a motor car Batmobile. It's not, you know, this is like I think the first time that I can think of where it's not the Michael Keaton era batmobile of like the kind of more cartoonish thing or the absolute tank that have been the nolan and the batfleck batmobiles this you know it just looks like a camaro or a corvette yeah it's a muscle like car been, yeah that's been modified to have this batman things to it well and that's the other thing like that again totally fits this version of batman the the motorcycle kind of devil may care rebel without a cause kind of batman that that they're constructing here and i love it right yeah everything about that whole scene is just fantastic for me one last positive i love the way they portray gotham like gotham is a character and they do sure. so like this the cinematography of of gotham in that like again it's very clearly representing New York. Like there's shots where you see some of the buildings that are in New York, some buildings that are, you know, transposed, some of that are put in, whatever. But it's it's a character. And it's such a gritty, dirty, beat up character that you really feel what I think the first Nolan Batman is trying to remark upon a little bit of like this once bustling metropolis is now like the seedy underbelly of it. And the, the Joker, the Joaquin Phoenix Joker character or Joker movie does such a good job of that too, of highlighting like the underbelly of this New York, essentially this, this Gotham. But I love the way that they portray the city as a whole. Yep. Like, I mean, I think the city to me almost gets more into the negatives for me. Okay. I mean, I don't, I don't, I mean, I would say like positives for sure. Like the performances of the actors were fantastic. Yeah. Like the, uh, the penguin, what's his name? I can't think of his Colin name. Colin Farrell. Colin Farrell. Incredible. Like what a transformation. And what's her name is Catwoman. Oh, Zoe Kravitz. Zoe Kravitz. Yeah. Like their performances are fantastic. I just have issues with how their characters were used okay let's well let's get into that let's talk about those negatives like wh what is your issue with those characters so they're they're doing such and, and and successfully done of basing this whole story in a in a believable more grounded more realistic place right i'm genuinely at the point with i think with just batman in general of like we 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 got that exact thing in the nolan trilogy Sure. Very grounded. Batman is really your only, like, except for Heath Ledger's Joker, which is, like, absolutely full-blown comic Joker. Batman in that series is kind of, like, your only, like, real comic-accurate character. Sure. Everybody else is kind of, like, with a, a wink and a nod of, like, Anne Hathaway's Catwoman just has, like, the mask that flips up that suggests cat ears but nothing really about her is Catwoman. And that's, I had the exact same problem with this movie of Batman is actually my only real connection to this comic book story. Sure. And then it's, then you've got everybody else's names that obviously I recognize as a fan of the comic book, but there's, there's nothing about Catwoman that just really screams that she's Catwoman. And, and I don't I, even know if they call her Catwoman at any point. I they just call her Selena either. Kyle. Yeah, I don't know either. The Riddler is like not the Riddler. He's just a dude that has a question mark, you know, See, with like white out. To me, like, I, I agree wholeheartedly. Like, you're right. None of these characters are comic book characters. But I think that this is where it skirts that fine line of not origin story, but origin story enough. And here's what I mean. The Selena Kyle character, she's wearing basically like a ski mask. I mean, right. so like on one side, you're right. It's vaguely reminiscent of that cat aspect. She's more of the cat burglar kind of character than she is cat woman type of character. 
Right. The Riddler, he's wearing basically a gas mask of some sort. The Penguin doesn't look anything like... Certainly not Danny DeVito, no. but like even like just comic book. Not comic book, right. <laughs> With the laugh. And the and like, cigar. And like, yeah, the long yeah. like cigarette stick, That's whatever those it. things yeah, are yeah. called. The tuxedo with the the tails in the back, like nothing that would suggest, or the umbrella. He doesn't carry right. an umbrella. So like th- that's, nothing that's what I'm saying. is like, like giving me those icons. I agree completely. And like I don't want to justify those things, but it's almost like okay, so these characters are becoming that, or they will become those. But this is their first iteration. I mean, you don't really get to see like the penguin is not. He's not a good guy by any means, but he is not the big bad in this. He right. happens to be kind of like an ancillary character who's actually like the number two to another big character. Falcone? Is it Falcone? Either Falcone or I think it was Fal- Falcone was, which I don't, that's another like thing. Is I wish they didn't use that actor because he's in a bunch of goofy shit. And now you want me to think that he's like this big bad so, mob boss. All, all that to say, like, I, I agree completely. The, the only real comic book accurate i guess you could say character is batman but also that's a little bit of like what i kind of appreciate about it is you have some of that realism where of course none of these other people for the most part are as rich as bruce wayne is supposed to be so like of course selena kyle is you know this kind of just she's a a server she she's not going to have all of this technology she's not gonna be able to afford this beautiful suit so she's got like essentially a latex suit, a decent motorcycle, and a ski mask. You right. know, the, the Paul Dano Riddler character is again aloof. He's he's got a lot of mental health issues, so he's not going to afford this beautiful green and purple suit. He's going right. to be okay. I've got a gas mask, and that's what I'm going to do. So like in that, I actually I kind of respect that decision because if you if you were to do the other thing, if you were to play into that you would have gone to the 90s Batman and people would, I don't think I've taken it as seriously. I don't, I don't need you to go the full Schumacher with it. You know, <laughs> with, with Two-Face with the perfectly middle thing. I don't need that. But you could, you could have had Catwoman one time meow for me. <laughs> you you could have had, you know, or, or her have some gloves with like... The claws. I, I, after I watched this, I went back and was like watching clips of Batman Returns. Right. Michelle Pfeiffer will always be Catwoman. Like, there will never be <laughs> anything that tops that. Obviously, like, Tim Burton took it to the extreme, but you could have had just some of those elements that help, you know, sure. s- suggest that character to me. Right. Other than just saying that her name is Selena Kyle and having little points in her hat. <laughs> right. Anything. Like I love one, one meow. I've got a thing for strays. <laughs> yeah, no, I didn't do it. But that wasn't enough. Like I need, I need more. Like I need something that where you are connecting for some reason. Like, and which it's a bit of a complaint too about Batman. Right. I don't know. Like you know, and granted, I don't need to see your parents' death. Like, it's such a hard thing for me to grasp. But like, why is this version of Batman obsessed with bats? I get it. You're the creature of the night and all this kind of stuff. But like, we don't ever get an explanation for th- this Batman. Why are you Batman? Right. Which, I mean, you know, I, I, I don't guess you could really say she is Catwoman because I don't know that they ever call her that or anything like that. The Penguin. But they do call him the Penguin. Okay, so they call him the Penguin, but, like, for the majority of the time, though, they call him Oswald. Right, Oz or Oswald. Oz right. or Oswald. They right. don't really ever – it's not an identifier. Right. It's more just, like, you know, just, like, hints. And for me, it makes Batman stick out. Absolutely. And I'm like – you know, everything else is so grounded and so stripped of all of these comic book references. I almost feel like Batman doesn't make sense to the point that I'm like, I think it's almost goofy that he's dressed up like a bat. <laughs> I thought the same thing of like, th- there's those moments where it's almost like people are looking at him like, huh, that's what you're dressed as. Exactly. Like what, like that f- after, after that scene of him in, in the subway station, and then he sees the bat signal, and they go up to where the mayor was just murdered, and he walks in with all the cops. Right, right. And all those cops are looking at him like, like what, what is this guy here for? I'm looking at it as like, why are you dressed like that? <laughs> yeah, I, I thought the same. And like, as much as I love And it Jeffrey, pulled me out, it, and I hated it. Does, it. it does. And like, as much as I love Jeffrey Wright, and I love his commissioner, well, he's not Commissioner Gordon at this point, he's a... Uh, De- chief chief detective or something i forget yeah. what he is Captain um, gordon you're 100 right that takes me out of it he goes to that first murder scene and it's like dude 
everyone else is dressed like a normal cop and you're this idiot in a cowl. Like Yeah, and a cape. And a cape. Are you you're wearing a cape, dude? <laughs> yeah. You can't come in here with a cape on. <laughs> Get out of here. And it's like, huh. You're the only one who's almost like hook, line, and sinker bought into this persona that you've created. Yeah. That I have I have all the reference for because I've seen Schumacher and and uh, I've seen Nolan and I've seen Burton and I've seen the the sixties Adam West version. Like I've seen these things. So I understand all that, but not every right. viewer is necessarily gonna get all that. So like right. you're just some dude in latex. I mean, it's just because everything else is so brought down to realism. Right. That it then makes me question, like, what are you doing, man? Like <laughs> nobody would do that. Right. Nobody would dress up like a bat. Like they'd look at you like you're an idiot. Right. I hate I hated that I had that thought because like it is still beautiful and like the 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 scenery and looking at the murder and like we're actually getting this like detective version of right. Batman. Right. It's fantastic. But like I, I at agree. At the same time, I'm just like, I wish there were way fewer people in this room. I agree wholeheartedly. So that you don't look like an idiot right well, now. And, and that's like you kind of do. What I said earlier about like Paul Dano's Riddler, it's it's the antithesis of that. Like it makes one hundred percent sense to me that the Riddler is some, you know, kind of nutcase dude with a gas mask. Because that actually makes sense. Totally. And, and then you you juxtapose that with the Batman. You're you know, you're a six foot brawny six foot two brawny dude in a cape. And everybody right, else with, with, with a collar. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Your cape has a collar, sir. Right. And by the way, you're you're wearing, you know, sixteen pounds of eye black, too. <laughs> <laughs> right. You're right. It takes me out of that. Yeah. As much as I appreciate the realism of the other characters, it all it detracts from Batman as much as Batman detracts right. from the the realism because it's not supposed to be real. It's supposed to be this comic book right. version of things. All right. So Another kind of gripe that I had yep. just personally is like watching it in the theaters. The movie is so visually dark, and I don't mean in tone, but just like every scene is in blackness. Because you saw it in theaters. Like you went and saw it, saw it. Yeah. There were times where it's like hard to see what's going on. Right. Like there's one, there's one scene specifically where Batman's going down through a hallway fighting a bunch of dudes. And the only light in the whole scene is the muzzle flashes of the guns. Right. And it's a pretty long shot. Like, it's not just like a couple of punches. Like, he goes through about five or six dudes. And I just, like, remember thinking, like, at that point, and this is, like, definitely in the second half of the movie, I was just like, God, I'm so tired of being dark. Like, I just <laughs> want to be able to see the action. Like, I don't want to see flashes and you know, and just shadows moving around. Like I would really like to be able to see what I'm supposed to be seeing. And yeah. I remember that being a bit frustrating. Yeah, I don't disagree. I mean, it's it's almost like from the the cinematography perspective of like, okay, so we made this dark. We didn't light it very well to begin with for a particular reason. Now let's like turn the saturation way down. And like yeah. let's just like it's not black and white, but it's damn near close. It's black, white, and red. <laughs> it really is. Those are the three colors you get in that movie. Yeah, and you you get some like like hints of like dark like hunter green. Yeah. So for me, I didn't have that experience because I watched it on HBO Max. Like I watched it at home. Right. I don't have, you know, whatever my settings on my TV like it it made it like that hallway scene or that scene. I I remember clearly of like that's darker than the others, but I could still see what was going on. And it wasn't just right. like muzzle flashes that illuminated the scene. To me, that didn't take me out of it as much as just like the drab nature of everything in that. Right. Like it left me kind of feeling like, huh, like there's no <laughs> right. there's no bright spot in this at all. And maybe that's the point. And like, I don't need a movie to be happy by any means, but there's just like. There's no bright spot in this at all. Yeah, no, but the, the contrast is a great thing, though. You know, like, <laughs> right? Just just moments to be able to like you know reset exactly. before you get back into that drabness. Like, because like yeah, you're totally right. Like there are no like breathable moments of and maybe that's hints it hints of positivity. And, and I know that that's kind of hypocritical of what I said earlier of how much I loved the dark and I loved Gotham as a whole, but it's almost like. You've given me no levity, right? Which I guess for me, 
and I don't know if you read the Frank Miller Batman series or like Batman Year One or anything like that, but like that's what those are. Like they're all just so dark. So right. like I get I get it. I one hundred percent get it. I mean that that was like my big takeaway walking out of the theater was that you know, I really appreciate so much of like how it is a different take. Yeah. And it's absolutely. not just the same old Batman story. It's not just the same old Batman movie. It's a it's a completely different take on it. It's different. It's unique. But at the same time, I think it's I think too, it's just man, we get so much Batman. Yeah, we do. We're still not that far removed from arguably the the best iteration of the Batman story. Nope. You know, we've had amazing jokers. So you know, there's there's Batman TV shows constantly being done, and right. there's just so much Batman media that even just it being cool and different and unique, at the same time, I'm like, yeah, but that thing we, we just had a couple of years ago was was probably better than this, right? And maybe it can, maybe the next one can elevate it. I, I think for me, I would say, despite its foibles, it is still great, and and I I know you've seen it twice. I, yeah. I'm gonna watch it again. I can say I absolutely enjoyed it, and I'm looking forward to what they're going to do with it. And I don't disagree. Like we've been beat over the head with Batman, and that like we okay, we get it, we get what Batman is. But like for that, it's impressive to me that that thing is made. It's made in this kind of climate. It's made in this culture, and it's made against all those backdrops of everything else. And it's still successful. It's not perfect, but it's still successful. Yeah, I, I if I look at it at the same place as i look at batman begins right it's in a great spot didn't didn't come out of batman begins either thinking like wow this is the best version of batman we've ever got right you know it wasn't until the dark knight that you were really blown away by that take on that story correct so you know hopefully this does the same thing so for me the last point i want to bring up is the three hour runtime i mean it's like just shy of three hours oh yeah because i watched it on hbo max I was able to watch it in two different sittings. Yeah. So like for me, I didn't get that fatigue that a lot of people that I've talked to got pretty early on about that, like hour and 45 minute mark about halfway through there was that like, okay, what are we doing here? So yeah. like, I want your perspective. Like I, I feel like even though I broke it up into two different viewings, you could have cut, a good at least half hour, maybe 45 minutes, and it would have been just as good, maybe better. So I want your your opinion, like seeing it in theater straight through. What are your thoughts? I, I'm, I'm totally in that group of people. Like there's a point like two thirds of the way through the movie where they finally get Falcone. Mm -hmm. You think that that's like the, the end of the riddles because it's the rat with wings and you found him and he's asking to bring him into the light and you did it. And, like, I remember, like, they're thinking of, like, wow, that was really, like, anticlimactic in. Like, you got the guy. And, all right, well, I guess that's just where it's going to end. And then it, but then it's, like, you, you finally remember because they were dealing with Falcone individually for so long as such a big part of the movie. You're, like, oh, crap. They don't have the Riddler yet. He's yeah. still out there, too. We still got to get this other Crap. Guy. We still got to go get the Riddler. And there was, like, that, that <laughs> sense of, like, <sighs> okay. Let's keep going. Right. What are you guys going to do with this? Yeah. I think they, they, they totally could have trimmed a lot of that Falcone stuff. I do want to say one final thing, and that to me is is the, the analysis, that kind of literary analysis that I, I really took away. And it, it's what is this film about? And this film to me is about generational trauma. I mean, they, they just throw it in your face. So it's not difficult to make that analytical g uh, jump. I mean, sins of the father. How many times have they mentioned that kind of idea? I, I love that they're dealing with that. He can't leave because he feels responsible in some way. Like you are the continuation of the Waynes and you're responsible for the, the things that your family has done. I'm not saying is that, that. Is that your interpretation? You got that out of the movie? I got that's that out of the movie. Just you, you got that out of the movie. Yeah, I got that. I out didn't of, get that out of the I didn't. I mean, I got the obviously like sins of the father and stuff like that. Yeah. But I did not get him nope, accepting 100, that 100%. as like, this is my job. Yep. I, I 100% got that. Because my father did this. Yep. Yeah. I, and I got that through that, that kind of the sins of the father thing of like, your dad did this. You're trying to, you know, you are a Wayne. He, you know, obviously the Riddler knows that you are the Batman. There's no denying that. So now it's him processing that and then saying like, 
well, I've got to do it. I've got to make these things right because the, I don't ever get that moment. Oh, I, don't ever I, get him I got it to that realization. so strong because like when he realizes something where the Riddler's like, we're both both orphans. You know, we both didn't have a future. Or we both, you know, whatever. And we're both lost and we're both alone. That's the recognition for me of when Batman is like, I have to actually do better. I have to redo that. What, what was it called? Not the new deal. What was it? The renewal? I think it was renewal. Renewal. Like, I have to do that. So I think that goes back to your uh, Alfred point of like, no, you've got to pick up the mantle of Bruce Wayne, of the Wayne family. While you're doing this Batman crap on the side, you've also got to do like the philanthropic Wayne thing and continue what your dad pushed as a front to do. I, I got that so strong. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to make it really difficult then to make Bruce Wayne this nonsensical, you know, that they're going to have to do a whole completely different take on Bruce Wayne. Well, I don't think so necessarily because, I mean, you get a lot. In he can't the, go out and be this, like, good guy that's doing the philanthropic work, saving what no, no, no. his dad did. I mean, think about the Nolan. Spin on what, because his dad was the bad guy. Right, but think about, like, I think that the was Nolan. what worked in the Nolan stuff was that his dad was this great man that everybody saw as this great guy built all these buildings and stuff and was saving the city. Right. And now Bruce Wayne is this prick of a kid that uh, nobody cares about him. We'll see. I I think he's doing the opposite and coming up as this great Bruce Wayne. Also, no, I don't see that working with the Batman. Everyone now knows that Bruce Wayne, sorry. Everyone now knows that Thomas Wayne was a terrible person because the Riddler pushed that out there. So now I think what they're going to do or what your possibility is, Bruce Wayne doesn't change who Bruce Wayne is. He's still this, uh, um, you know, reclusive kind of person. But now it's we've got to change this a little bit. We've got to make this better. And I think that's that's the change that they're going to make in this new iteration is that not that he's a, a good guy that he's, you know, running out and kissing babies and that kind of thing. I don't think that that's the play, but it's. I'm going to make this right. I'm going to make this city right. It's that almost that Harvey Dent kind of aspect that exactly, eventually I think that, we're going to get. That's Harvey Dent. That's not but Bruce I think, Wayne. But I think that that's what we're going to get. I think that like maybe he realizes, much like in the Nolan Batman, where he realizes he can't be that thing. He wants the best for Gotham, but he can't be that figurehead. It has to be somebody else like Harvey Dent. And I think that's where they're going to go with it. But that to me, that generational trauma, I, I, I challenge you to go back and watch it with that in mind and like that perspective. Oh, no, it, I mean, it's it's definitely I'm just saying I don't see the character making that choice in the film. Yeah, I, I definitely no, I do. think it's definitely there. And that's what they're implying. I'm just saying I didn't see it. You don't see in the him, character him making it. Okay. Yeah, I'm not saying it comes to full fruition. I'm just saying like that's the genesis of it, because ultimately he's also willing to sacrifice himself for the getting of the Riddler, for the betterment of Gotham as a whole. And I think that's the genesis of it. Certainly, I hope it works. <laughs> me, me too. I just I do. remember I coming do. out of that theater thinking like, I don't understand why this guy... Because like I, I just never saw anything in the movie right. to make me think that's why he cares. What's his motivation? And, and I've, I've heard that too of like, why does he care? What's his motivation here? What does he stand to gain in this case? Yeah, I, I, I see that point. Oh, you got anything else? That's it. <laughs> and I'm done. Well, we want to know what you think about the Sazerac rye. Have you been able to find a bottle, pick it up, try it? What's your thoughts on it? Yeah. What's a, what's a good base rye that you think uh, you know would, would challenge this? Because, I mean, it's, it's totally solid. Oh, yeah. But I think there's probably got to be something that's right in that same ballpark that's maybe a little bit more robust. Yeah. Are there better ryes? I think so. But I'm not disappointed by this by any means. Yeah, no. There's nothing. It's super friendly. Yep. We also want to know, what are your thoughts on the Batman? Yeah. How wrong am I? Tell me that this is the best <laughs> version of Batman we've ever had. I want to know, too, like, where do you see this version of the franchise going? How are they going to continue this? What are they going to do with it? 
You can get in touch with us through email. It's drippingstone at gmail.com. You also get in touch with us through social media. It's always one word, drippingstone, D-R-E-P and stone. Find us on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, Twitter. Find a thing, like a thing, share a thing. We'd appreciate that thing. And you can help support the podcast financially through our Buy Me A Coffee page. It's buymeacoffee.com slash drippingstone. You can tell someone about the podcast. allows us to hang out with more people. And you can rate Drippingstone wherever it is you find great podcasts like this one. Get those thumbs ups and those stars. We'd really appreciate it. Hey, buddy. Hey, buddy. May your glass overflow. Your, your ass never show. <laughs> Bat cheers. Vengeance cheers. <laughs> Vengeance cheers. The Whiskey Cave. The Whiskey Cave. I like it. Listen, I shot $70 whiskeys not that long ago, so I'm, I'm for it. <laughs> Government warning, according to the Surgeon General. Uh, they like their weeders. I got a bottle of Thomas Handy right here. Recording At the same time. In progress. I've been recording on something else. I just wanted to do that just in case. Oh, okay. You there? Did you freeze? Did you freeze? No. No, me neither. Full on. <laughs> uh, Christian Bale. Cheers. <laughs> We didn't even talk about that. <laughs> Who does it better? I I think Patman or Patman Patman. <laughs> That's it. It's not Pattinson. It's Patman. His bat voice is definitely the better. Oh, for sure it is. More controlled. Yeah. More subdued. Go oh, live in Italy. It's a happy place. It's all like it's really beautiful colors everywhere, man. You'll love it. You'll get out of this no. shit hole. No, I don't think Gotham I, City. I don't think he will love it because he likes the dark. And Did stone? I miss that? I missed that. Didn't I? Dark, 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 dark. Darker, 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 darker,